family gave me in the spirit of the season, yeah. gave me Call of Duty Mo Modern Warfare 3. See, this is what's so great about Facebook. I, I mean, I feel like I know you because you're very intellectual, you're very smart, we have you on the show, and then I'm on your Facebook page and I'm like, he plays Call of Duty? So see, I would never have known that without Facebook. He wouldn't have revealed that. Right, and, and I missed you at the Judas Priest concert. Yes, today. that's right. I, was, I think I was a couple of rows behind yeah. you. All right, so Jonathan is here today. Nico LaHood, who ran for, look, it says here on the, um, on the rundown sheet that you are the Bear County District Attorney. Oh, so yeah. That's yeah. nice. You know Merry, something I don't know. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, he ran for DA. He's an attorney in private practice, and although you can't see this on the radio, he is casually dressed today. I've never right. seen you in anything less than... You know, suspenders, suspenders uh, the the necktie perfectly integrated with everything else. Well, yesterday I took a half day, like Good I told you. you, went to the office for a little while, and then I promised my wife that we'd spend the day together shopping and doing family stuff. And I potatoes. thought Justice never took a day off. Well, I'm on call. I didn't oh, see. I was okay. off call. Right, I'm no, on call. Right. <laughs> but I'm taking a day off. So I didn't even shave. See that? How about that? Get a close-up of that, like Taylor. Like All that. right. So, and so you are here in lieu of doing Christmas shopping. For a period of time. Yeah. Why don't you tell her that Gang of Four takes nine hours? <laughs> no, I can't. You just ratted me out. See that? <laughs> all right. We need him all day here. Uh, and, and joining us again on uh, Gang of Four, I think this is second time, Carlos? Second time. Carlos Abelar, who is the number one Ron Paul supporter in our listening audience. When we were talking about the newsletter issue yesterday, Carlos, uh, if you hadn't called right away, I'd have sent the police over to your house. I'd have been worried about you. So I'm glad that you called. I'm glad you're here. On Gang of Four, and uh, and you also you've had a very exciting year. You got engaged this year. I did get engaged. I uh, proposed to my girlfriend at uh, my high school reunion. Wow! The mariachi and everything, the whole thing. Oh wow! What wow. a great setting. Yeah. So. so next year at Christmas time, you'll be hiding here with Nico from Christmas shop. <laughs> so we can count it. We'll just but we'll just pencil you in right now for this uh, time next year. All right, on Gang of Four today, there is so much to talk about, and and yesterday uh, we saw this uh, great moment of political theater over the payroll tax holiday. Um, the, the image of the president surrounding himself with the human shields of middle class pizza partiers, you got to hand it to him. Uh, he and the Democrats masterfully outmaneuvered the Republicans over something that really at the end of the day is not a game changer for the economy, Jonathan. <clears throat> and the silly thing is, if the Republicans were going to make a stand on this, and there's a good argument to be made about why the temporary cut to social, the tempor temporary payroll tax cut or the payroll tax holiday doesn't do anything but increase the deficit for Social Security. But if they were going to make that stand, then they should have done it a long time ago. To wait until the week before Christmas to suddenly decide, oh, we're going to we're going to stand on principle, the House Republicans, we're going to stand on principle. That was a losing, that was a losing battle. Especially after in the Senate, even the Tea Party, you know, <laughs> Rubio in the Senate, and the Tea Party members in the right. Senate supported the compromise. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and you're fighting over two months versus 12 right. months. And you're going to get the 12 months anyway. And you're going to get it anyway. Yeah. So, is it any wonder, Nico, that people uh, have record low uh, approval for this Congress, and in general, find it very hard to even take seriously uh, the debate and what goes on in Washington. I mean, this is this is Exhibit A. No, that doesn't surprise me at all, and I think it just shows that everyone in Congress is out for, I think, party lines. We've talked about this other times I've been on the show. I mean, you have fighting amongst the Republicans. I think Jonathan was talking about that between the House and the Senate that they didn't even agree on this. This wasn't a Republican stance. This was just Boehner, or I always pronounce his name wrong, sorry. Boehner stance and, and only certain Republicans that, that, that was fighting against the Democrats on this deal. And I think it was horrible maneuvering, bad strategy, and they made them look bad. They have egg on their face now because they had to actually admit that they agree with the president and the Democrats. Carlos, do you think the class warfare thing for the president is going to work? I mean, it may not work for the people in this room, but when you think about the, the audience he's trying to reach, is it working? Uh, I think it will work because he plays to the emotions of people. It's very easy to uh, tell people, I'm going to give you this because what people vote for is what you can see, but what people don't realize is there's a lot of unseen, a lot of unintended consequences that 
it takes a lot, it takes money out of the economy to to do what he's promising. So when you play to the emotions, of course, people are going to be uh, very receptive to that type of message. When I look at the Republicans, I, I don't think any of them are equipped to counter the. I am the defender of the family pizza night. I mean, good grief. Uh, what, what answer do they have for that? Did we need Herman Cain then? Yeah, we're no kidding. Uh, <laughs> we, maybe we need Herman Cain, bring him Herman Cain back. But I mean, seriously, with all the trouble, and the, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, he could be reelected on the basis of that kind of simple, uh, you know, this is a chicken in every pot from the 21st century, right? Right, and, and you mentioned in your last hour, you talked about this piece that Karl Rove wrote in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, Karl Rove says, oh, no, 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 this won't work. People aren't going to be fooled by Well, this. but it's not only that. It, it, it's that Republicans have to have a strategy to counter it. Thank you. <clears throat> They've known this. the opposition party. You know, it, right, but specifically this strategy. You know, Obama rolled it out in Kansas uh, earlier this month. We know what the next 12 months and next 11 months are going to look like. And what the Republicans have to do is show that, sure, once you have your pizza party, once Obama gets reelected, this is what the next four years are going to be. Expanded government, expanded bureaucracy, expanded regulation, limited economic growth, limit, limited liberty, higher taxes. In the end, everyone will have to pay higher taxes. You can kiss your 2% payroll tax goodbye after the election because everyone's taxes are going to have to go up. Why is it not obvious, as a, as a point of opposition, to say, Mr. President, if these people with you are so dependent on $40, then they are overtaxed. In other words, they need way more relief right. than that and, and, holiday. And here's the, and, and here's the thing. Uh, now everyone agrees tax cuts are good, right? We've moved the needle in that direction. <clears throat> everyone yes. agrees. Even the President agrees tax cuts are good for everyone. Right. So you've got one half of the equation done. But the other half of the equation is dealing with the spending that's that's driving our debt out of control. Okay, you're saying that. <clears throat> I said that. Boehner didn't say it. Mm -hmm. Cantor right. didn't say it. None of the Republican presidential candidates uh, said it. I mean, I think one of the biggest problems we have in this country is not that we we play politics, but that we don't have a true opposition. There is not a, a party and a cadre of people who are constantly saying, that's how it is, this is how it could be. The Republicans don't offer that kind of stark uh, choice for people. One of my callers said, why weren't they on right after him explaining the very things we're talking about now? I think, I think what you're talking about is doing a compare and contrast. That's what you have to do to beat Obama, in my opinion. You have to come say, what is he doing wrong and how can we do it better and here's my plan to do it better but it's more than just forty dollars though jack it's, it's eighty dollars it's forty dollars a paycheck correct so it's eighty dollars a month i mean right. people that live on budgets that's that's when you really think about that that's substantial that might be a thousand dollars a year for certain people almost a thousand dollars a year and that's substantial but it's it's a pizza party to somebody else but maybe it's it's dinners for another party for another family i mean a thousand dollars is attributed to everyone but my point was if you are that close to the point of not being able to make ends meet then you are obviously in need of more tax relief Absolutely. than this. Absolutely, and what I'm surprised the Republicans didn't do is say, you know what, we've been arguing for tax cuts for a long time. Right. I'm, I'm happy that the president finally sees it our way. Right. Now let's work right. on work, working on the spending. That, I think it was a strategy. Instead of saying we need a third party, we need a second party. Right. <laughs> now, Carlos, there was a story today in um, USA Today about how uh, when you look at voter registration in the two parties, uh, two and a half million people just since 2008 have left the roles of the Democratic and Republican parties and that's just people who were you know officially <coughs> members to begin with so it's probably much more than that in terms of people saying I don't consider myself one of those anymore to me that's a good thing and to me it isn't necessary that they find a home in another party. I think we're well served by a lot of voters being free-floating and independent because then people have to really work for those votes every election. Yeah, I think it's a reflection of what you've been saying that um, it's, a, it's two different parties, but one, but government always grows and people are getting tired of that, so they choose to stay <coughs> neutral and they want them, the parties, to fight for their vote. I think it's good because um, ultimately 
the people need to realize that they're the ones with power. So when they take away the power of giving the, giving it to the parties, it comes back to them. Isn't that obvious? I mean, it seems obvious to me that when a political party knows it can count on you, when you're in that group of people that they know uh, they have, you get nothing. You, you, they insult you. They, you, you have no uh, ability to demand anything. You don't get anything. You're not listened to. I see this happening in both parties, and it's just amazing to me. If but, they can count on you, they're not going to work for you. But for the general election, it's known that independents are what um, they drive. Trying, they they drive, drive, you know, yeah. are going to make you uh, go over the top. So, in a way, for the primaries, maybe they don't. They each everybody goes left or right, but I guess they have to come back home to the center on some issues, maybe, or 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 they have to play to the independents. So the independents, as a group, have position themselves to be able to demand what they want. I agree with Carlos. I think it's, it's great that the independent, if you will, party, it's not even a party because there's no base in it, um, is getting bigger because it's causing people to meet somewhere in the middle and, and really look at both sides and serve truly all the people, not just the political party. But the problem is there's no base with the quote-unquote independent party and you're not going to get a representative of that party to actually run for office. No. And, you know, no. That, that, I think that that's potentially a but problem. But you want to be that X factor that they're afraid sure. of so that they don't know just by walking the line of their party, just by following Boehner or following Pelosi, that will be enough. They, you, you, they always have to wonder, how is this playing with people that, that don't belong on either team? But haven't you noticed in the GOP debates, I mean, you're kind of seeing people, you know, what we see in past is, you know, the Democrats play to the left wing during the primaries, the Republicans play to the super right wing in the primaries, and then in the general they kind of flip-flop around and meet somewhere in the middle. And that's... That's a polite way of putting it, I well, think. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm trying to be polite. Yeah. It was a PG show. So, I mean, that's the problem. But now I think you're seeing, at least what I've seen in the GOP um, prime, um, debates, is that they're kind of putting out issues of you have to work with both people. Romney spoke about it the last debate. <clears throat> so did Newt. He spoke about it the last debate about how you have to work with both sides to get things done. But Is that working though, Jonathan? Because every time I hear Romney say that, I just in, I, I think I know what he's referring to, but I envision a lot of people saying, I, I don't want more of that. I don't <clears throat> want another guy who's saying that. Well, uh, I think Romney, and I don't, frankly, I don't think he's articulated this argument well enough. I think our, uh, Romney has a good point in saying, look, I was the Republican governor of the most liberal state in the and country. the most democratic state. And if we wanted to get anything done, right. I had to work with the legislature. Right. I had to work with the Democratic leaders. Unlike President Obama, who ignores and insults the Republican leaders of Congress and just le lets them, leaves them out in the cold. So I think that's, he can actually... Uh, articulate a, a smart message on that. I don't think he's done it, but but on a, in a broader sense, you know, this idea that somehow halfway between the Republicans and the Democrats is is, is true north, that that's where the real politics of this country lie. I think that's false, and you know, poll after poll shows that on on balance, more independents or most Americans are center-right. They're not, and, and especially if you look at the way the Pelosi and Reid Congress and, and the Obama White House have dragged this country to the, the left over the last three years. We're not halfway between the two parties. It's much closer to the Republican point, point of view right now if they articulate the message correctly. Well, first of all, they've got to learn their point of view. I don't think they're, they're terrible at articulating it. I, I hear people like you and other people outside the party constantly explaining it. But, but here's the other thing. I would agree with you on fiscal and government uh, issues. I don't think the country is that right of center on social issues. You're right. I, uh, agree, I, with I agree with that. And, and unfortunately for Republicans, just when they start to get it right on the fiscal issues, they are tempted to push or, or reach for some of the social issues. They cannot keep their hands off and it's like walking by that candy dish. You walk by ten times, eventually you're going to take a piece. They cannot help themselves with pushing uh, you know, crazy social uh, wedge issues that especially at this point with the economy going over a cliff, people just don't want to hear about. Right? Yeah. I think a message that would resonate with independents and what I think that will resonate in this general election is that freedom should be your the main principle. 
But what's happened is that we've chopped up freedom into two pieces. There's the Democrats and liberals that want you to be free on civil liberties, and then you have the right and conservatives that want to be free on economic issues. Yeah. The point is that it was never supposed to be broken up. Right. It's supposed to be one package. And I think if you can articulate that message, I think that's a winning message for the 2012 election. It, it probably feels scary to them because I think they're so you, each party is so used to its crutches that it's hard to give them up. But, you know, I would sum it up as pursuit of happiness. You are saying to people, this is in our founding language, pursue your happiness. We will not get in your way. It doesn't mean anarchy. It doesn't mean people marrying an you know, farm animals. It just means we don't care what you do to be happy, to find your happiness. We're just going to be good stewards of these few things that we're entrusted with. And it's going to be a process because it's been a process to get to where we're at now. But it'll take a long time. It'll take a long time to get back. I mean, it's generational. You may be the only guy in the room still alive when that happens, Carlos. <laughs> but we'll hope for you. All right, we're back with more Gang of Four on a Friday morning. It's 1025. Karen Klaus in the newsroom on 550 KTSA. Alright, 10.30, the news and talk of San Antonio 550 KTSA. On our gang of four today, we have Carlos, Nico, and Jonathan. You're voting in the JR poll at 599-5555. Uh, this week, uh, the governor of Iowa, Terry Branstad, said that if Ron Paul actually wins the Iowa caucuses, then all that will matter is who came in second. And again, for people that have this sense that they don't really care what we think or how we vote and that everything is preordained and rigged. Uh, it, it's quite a, you know, mask-slipping uh, moment. Now, I'm not a Ron Paul supporter, but why does it not matter if Ron Paul wins the Iowa caucus? I'm confused. Uh, it, wouldn't that be just as legitimate as Mitt Romney winning it or Newt Gingrich winning it? Or Huckabee winning it? I mean, uh, Iowa hasn't really been a good... Uh, um, indicator. Indicator that uh, you're going to become the nominee, but if it's the will of the people, it's very elitist to come out and say that don't worry about first place, yeah. just pay attention to second or third. I mean, this from the people that want to spread democracy around the world, Jonathan? Well, <clears throat> I, though, I don't want, I'm not going to misinterpret his words, but I will say this. The Iowa caucuses are a very s small segment of the Republicans, sure. the people who go to the caucuses. It's an incredibly spe you know, specialized yeah, group, it's highly a, motivated. It's a very small number of people yeah. in a very small state. Yeah. And it only matters. I mean, no it only one, matters because it's first. It matters because it's first, and no one even paid attention to it until 1976 when right. Jimmy Carter won the uh, Iowa caucus in, in the Democratic, on the Democratic side. And he came out of nowhere and won the and won the nomination. But he didn't say whoever wins, it won't matter. He said if this guy wins. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm not a fan of Ron Paul's. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. what, how is this? Uh, you know, let the people decide. Let the people decide unless they decide wrong, unless they decide on somebody uh, I don't, we don't like. Yeah, but I, I, you're you're reading his statement as a prescription. I'm reading it as a description. Like and, an analysis. And the description is that even if Ron Paul wins Iowa, okay. he doesn't have the kind of broad-based support to sustain a campaign that's going to get him anywhere close to winning the nomination. But if the Republican Party is, if the premise of the, of the Republican primary system is we go through these series of contests and the voters collectively figure out uh, who the best uh, candidate is, then why are you already uh, telling them they're going to get it wrong if they nominate this guy or if this guy wins in Iowa. I mean, I understand I may be, I may be reading into his remarks, but I think they beg to be read into because I don't remember in prior years the governor of the state saying, don't pay any attention to these results if this guy wins. Well, I'm guessing he, he uh, I don't know this for a fact, but has he endorsed Romney? He's endorsed one of them. I okay, know so there right. you go. There's your answer. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, think it's, I think it's a case where... Uh, you know the the rules for Ron Paul. The Republican Party is 
is clearly not going to brook this this Ron Paul revolution. This is not getting anywhere. This is not, these and, voters and, are and not getting should, away. And with why it. should the party? Why well, should why should someone who's run as an independent and won't rule out running as an independent? And independent this time, and could sink right. a Republican candidate. That's, why should they take him seriously? That's fine, but then let's the not candidate. pretend yeah. that the nominee of the party is really up to this process of people coming out in their respective states and voting. Let's not pretend that that's the case. Let's admit that there really are rules, or, or uh, you know, like when I they put rules. when they put bumpers on the um, on the bowling alley so you can't bowl a gutter. Ron ball. Paul's gonna, he'll get the delegates from Iowa. He's going to get them. No one's taking those delegates away. Right. He's going to get those well, let's delegates. Let's not pretend that this is a, a process where anybody could get that nomination. Because it isn't. Well, but you're making it seem like there's some conspiracy that's going to prevent Ron Paul from getting... Yes, that's what I'm saying. Ha how? Why? They're uh, who, not going to let it happen. They're not who's going to let they? it happen. Who is they? The, 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 the big money people, the establishment <laughs> people in the Republican Party, the people, mean, the people who believe that the endorsement of Bush 41 is a big thing. But that's a big that's a big indicator. You know, I, I don't know whether the, whether the ultimate nominee is going to be Gingrich or Romney or Perry or Huntsman, who it's going to be, but I don't think it's decided. You think you think it's been you think it's already I'm decided. I'm not saying it's someone decided, decided it. on one person. I'm just saying that there is already a decision. We're not let. And by the way, I'm not saying this just about the Republicans, Jonathan. I believe you saw the same wheels turn in 2004. Howard Dean was not going to be the Democratic nominee. That would have been ruinous. They weren't going to do that. It wasn't going to happen. It, well, it, it was not the scream on the stage well, that did it. I mean, Howard but that Dean. was supposed to be the same thing in 2008. Hillary Clinton and the Clinton machine was supposed, no one was supposed to be able to challenge the Clintons. And someone did it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just, I mean, there is a process. The parties have in, within them vested interests who are going to make sure that a sacrificial, uh, you know, symbolically pure but unelectable candidate does not get yeah, that nomination. I, I mean, I hear that, but having been involved in, in Republican politics at the grassroots level, uh, I, I fail to have seen at any time anyone give some kind of marching orders to well, Republican. Well, at the grassroots level. Well, but they're the ones who level. vote. They're the ones who come out and vote right. in the primaries. Right. And, and there's been no directive from some smoke-filled room that says, "Thou shalt not vote for this person." Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't come out and say it. But <laughs> when you're when you're telling the delegates before they gather in their caucuses, you can forget about Ron Paul. Does never a directive. I, you, I think you're letting it be. I mean, I'm, uh, does that sound to you like you're yeah. you're sending a, me a subtle message? There's never a directive, but there's an understanding, and the understanding is that we don't want to elect a guy that wants to cut a trillion dollars because. He's going to cut it from our pet projects or what we, uh, from our donor base. So, yeah, like I see, uh, I see the way you're saying, like, it's not a conspiracy to say we don't want this guy, but it feels like one because it always seems like he's running uphill. Well, look, I mean, I, I do agree with Jonathan that Ron Paul should not expect a warm welcome from a party that he has thrown under the bus, that he does not... Uh, even pretend loyalty toward and he ran against and, and, and he ran against and then he probably is going to run against again mm -hmm. I agree with that I'm not even saying they're wrong to do what 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 they're doing I'm not saying that it's a bad idea to screw the Ron Paul uh, candidacy and make sure it does not go too far I'm just saying we should note that that is being done that this is not truly a process where if Ron Paul caught fire and more and more people were liking this message every week, he could go all the way to Tampa. That is not going you, to happen. But you seem to be saying that Republican leaders and his challengers shouldn't bring up the fact that he's run as an Oh, no, of course they should. Or they shouldn't bring up the, the newsletter. Or they yeah, should, or and they we're going to talk about the newsletter. Or they shouldn't give up the conspiracy, you know, his conspiracy theories. Or oh, no. appearing on the Alex Jones show oh, I'm, and stuff I'm, like that. No, this. that all has well, to be brought up. Okay, then, then how is that different He from, would be a disastrous nominee okay, for the Republican Party. Okay, but you party. saying that, are you now part of this establishment? No, but I'm, I'm saying that's my opinion. But I'm not saying if the Republicans decided they wanted him, they should... Get him if the Republican rank and file wants but him. But that's what this whole process is him. about. Yes. All right, and, and and so they're debating this issue and they're bring, bringing the, these issues up. But there's no just because there happens to be a large uh, agreement, a significant significant agreement about what a uh, Ron Paul candidacy would mean. 
doesn't mean that there is a conspiracy to keep him off the ballot. That the process somehow doesn't work. That is the process working. Well, he's not being kept off the ballot. He's on the ballot. Right. And, the, and they to, to prevent him from get, getting the nomination. What I'm right. saying is, um, it is more of an illusion than a reality that the nominees of the two political parties are purely chosen by this primary system. We had a discussion one day on the show about the days when it was a smoke-filled room. Right. Those were the days when people didn't run for president, there when parties lot. were selecting uh, someone, and often against their will or very reluctantly. Uh, we had the author of a book about James Garfield who said Garfield was, was despondent uh, when they nominated him. He did not want it. Um, we, we think we've completely turned that upside down, and now there are no smoke-filled rooms, and now it's the will of the people, and boy, if this Ron Paul can do some more money bombs, and I know you're very enthusiastic about well, it, but you know, Carlos, deep down, you know I'm right, that as much as you like him, you know the Republican Party will never have him at the top of well, the well, ticket. Well, yeah, well, it's more about the message, why I like him, but I think you're touching on something very important when, when you say that, I mean, the governor of the state is almost like the president of the state, and if he's saying, if if, this, if Ron Paul wins, look for second place. I mean, that's very powerful. I mean, that's this is not a, a precinct chair saying it. This is the governor of a state saying that. So yes, and then there's already the mind tricks going on. I mean, the, the articles coming out about oh, the the Iowa caucus might get hacked and all that. So they're whoever they are that we don't agree that there's a day, but they're already setting up the for the mind for people to believe. Well, if he won, it was because they got hacked by. That uh, the unanimous people or this and, and I'm that. not and I'm not saying so that you don't think Jonathan I'm completely insane you can just think I'm partially <laughs> insane I am not suggesting they've already decided and they decided three years ago it would be Romney I'm not saying that I'm just saying in this instance they there are there look it's an investment for people they're not going to let their investment be squandered they're not going to let their party and their party's chance at victory be squandered by a guy that they know cannot win so they're not going to take a chance on this getting too out of hand. But, but it's not just that he cannot win, it's the reasons why he can't I agree win. with the reasons. Yeah. But I'm not thing... saying they're wrong, I'm just, I, I think it's time to admit that we don't really freely in an unfettered way pick these nominees. But this even goes to like Newt, I mean we always heard, when Newt started rising they started saying, hey, uh, the establishment doesn't want Newt because of what he did in the past. So when you hear someone say the establishment, it's not, there's not a directive but the establishment is the establishment, and there is a force in there that does play, that trickles down to the grassroots level. And there is an understanding. I, I became a Republican um, precinct chair for the like, last couple of years locally, and there's not a directive, but there's an understanding that Ron Paul people are not um, looked very friendly upon. Well, can I tell you why? I mean, uh, yeah. they can't count on you. Uh, you're not going to, you know, in four years when Ron Paul's not running, they don't know that you will still be a Republican. They're not even sure you are one now. And if he left the party today and said, I'm now joining, I'm, I'm forming the Ron Paul party, you'd go with him. So it's it's perfectly logical why they would think that. I don't fault yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, but, but I think they think that because... Um, because Ron Paul's invite, invited that by running as a libertarian, but I think his message now has been very clear that the party is an empty vessel. You have to fill it in with your values, and you, if you wanted to represent what you believe in, you have to change it. So I know that it's not going to take two years to change, three or four years, but I want to be a Republican because I because I know the political system is very biased against the third party. You're third, hoping that the political that the party becomes more like him. yes, and and the debates have changed because of what he's been talking is, about. Jonathan, is that is that a valid point? Is Ron Paul, even though he he won't succeed at being the nominee? Is he changing? Do you think he's leaving a mark on the Republican Party? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, do you give him credit for moving? Carlos says he's affected the tone of or moved the needle in these debates. Do you agree? I, I, look, I give Ron Paul credit for being very consistent about the Federal Reserve, about earmarks, about. Uh, about debt, about the gold standard, about a lot of economic issues that have been borne out over the last couple of years. I think events have pushed the party and the candidates in that direction, not mm -hmm. Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. So it may be coincidental in some ways that they are now, several of them are now discussing these things that he's been on for Look, I mean, you know, the, 20 the, or 30 years. The issue years. now is that what the next November's election is going to be about the size and scope of government. How big of a government do we want 
how intrusive do we want it to be, and how much are we willing to pay for it? That's been a Ron Paul issue for his entire political career. I give him credit for that. But the events of the last four years and the stimulus and Obamacare and all these other things and the bailout and right TARP have driven that issue to the top. But I think the issue that you're talking about, Jack, that now that we're talking about issues that Ron Paul's been talking about for years gives him credibility, and I think he has. I've watched all the debates, and I think that he has influenced the debates. Where, I mean, he's obviously not going to be the nomination. I don't think he's got the charisma. I don't think he has the issues. I just he can't be the the, the obvious. But every nominee. you know we we've watched this in the, in this cycle. But listen you know, to four, the answer four times now that the non Romney can candidate has come to the top uh, that down. hasn't gotten right. who hasn't had much national scrutiny. And then when they get it, when the, then when they get that scrutiny, they wither. Yeah. And now, <clears throat> you know, it, Herman Cain had it, Gingrich had it. Now he's sunk. Now Ron Paul is, is coming up. And people who only hear the economic side think, "Wow, yeah, this guy ha has it right." But then when they hear the rest of it, right. they're going to say, "My God, we can't possibly vote." Let's talk that. about the rest of it after we take a quick break. Here it's ten forty-four. Gang of Four continuing at five fifty KTSa. Say headlines. Ten forty nine, news and talk of San Antonio five fifty KTSA. We're just having a good old fashioned political debate by the fireside here with Jonathan Gerwitz, Nico LaHood, and Carlos Abelar. All right, uh, Carlos, you and I talked about this on the air yesterday. The newsletter issue for Ron Paul. Um, I, this is an old issue f for those of us here in Texas. We've talked about it on the radio here for years and years. Texas Monthly's article was, I think, right. fifteen years ago. But this is new or news to the rest of the country that for many years, I think while he was out of Congress, uh, Ron Paul lent his name, I guess is the way to say it, to a series of newsletters that had some uh, kooky, wacky uh, content. Not that every issue was chock full of it, but some pretty uh, bizarre statements were made and assertions were made. I, I don't know if I'd call them racist. I would certainly call them politically incorrect. And I guess for me, uh, Jonathan, I look at this and I think, um, there were so many better ways to handle this than to rip the microphone off on CNN and, and, and act like you don't have to deal with this and you've already dealt with it. If, if anything, we know that once you rise to the top of the polls, it's your turn in the barrel, right? I mean, this is, this is the mark of a, you're, you're serious now. They're taking you seriously. And, and he hasn't had a good answer for it for 15 years. And now, finally, his answer is... Well, I really didn't know. I put my name on it, but I really didn't know what, what was in those, those newsletters. But I saw a video this morning where he was touting, uh, it's, it's on the internet today, where he's touting the newsletter and he's holding it up and he's talking about what's in it. So, and Carlos, I mean, I don't know how long you've been a Ron Paul fan, but certainly uh, if you had been a Ron Paul fan or if you had been alive uh, in the 80s, you would have, I mean, you would have assumed, seeing his name on a newsletter, that this is his stuff. These are his views, right? Uh, yeah, I would have, you kinda I would have can't, assumed something like that was going on. It's, it's one thing if I'm the editor of a magazine, I may not, the views in the magazine may not be mine, but if the, if the newsletter is named after me, there's really no divorcing myself from that, right? But, but yeah. listen, it, it's not just that it's a thing from the past. It's that Ron Paul continues to say things today, including in, in the Iowa debates, that conform to that kind of conspiratorial mindset. Right. When he says, and, and, and I did a, I did a, a blog entry a few months ago, right? it was back in, in August, I think, where he was talking to a group in New Hampshire, and someone brought up 9-11 conspiracy theories, and he said, yeah, he said, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good right. stuff there. There's good reason to believe that. Right. Just the other night when he, at the debate, he was talking about how the United States is waging war against a, bi a billion Muslims. If we, if we do anything to stop Iran, we're waging war against a billion, 1.2 billion Muslims. Right. As if, you know, everything that we've done uh, in Bosnia, in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, somehow we're out to destroy Muslims. Well, I think you're reaching on the 9-11 thing. Um, what do you mean reaching? Well, because you're trying to say that he believes in the conspiracy, that there was that, that the Bush administration planned 9-11, and he doesn't believe that. No, he believes Ron, Ron he believes that the government 
is too dumb to pull that off. How can the go the government can't get anything right right now, but they're smart enough to pull that off? Obviously, what he's talking about is the investigation about how it led up to that. How did we train people in, in Florida, giving them visas and all this, that type of investigation, that investigation of the Bush administration. So you're reaching. Ron Paul said last week, when the towers came down, people in the White House cheered, that they were happy that, about the 9-11 attacks. How do, you, how do you explain that, Carlos? Okay, so since 1998, Ron Paul's been giving speeches during the... During the um, uh, Clinton administration that the neoconservatives in the House and the Senate have been trying to fight a war with 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 Iraq. His point of he, he didn't say they cheered. He said that they had glee because it give okay. it gave them an incentive now to go to war with Iraq, which so, it, which so it did when three thousand American when three thousand Americans were killed, people in the Bush White House had glee. Does that sound like a very American thing to I say? Know, but, but but you're trying to make it seem like if. At that but, moment, uh, uh, people were happy. No, of that's course. That's what he said. Of course, of course. Well, at the moment, like a couple days later, they're thinking, "Hey, how are we going to go to war with Iraq?" I mean, people were talking about this for a long time about going to war with Iraq. I mean, you, I mean, you know this. I yeah. mean, you know that they were trying to go to war with Iraq. So, does this give them justification? We're well, looking back. It did, right? They were saying there's weapons of mass destruction, and it didn't turn out to be that way. Now there's now there now Iran has uh, nuclear weapons, and what happens if it doesn't turn out to be that way? Ten years later. We, we can be, is Iran going to be the new Iraq? Are you willing to admit, Jonathan, because I, I hear, I, I understand what both of you are saying. Are you willing to admit, A, that there was a pre, there was a, a, uh, a group of people who were waiting for a moment when they could fight the Iraq war again, the Gulf war again, and get it right this time. And are you willing to admit that um, people are more skeptical now of the war drums about Iran because they feel disappointed by the outcomes in Afghanistan and Iraq. Is that a reasonable thing? Yeah, the second that's point, not what he said. Right. Is that reasonable? Yeah, the second point is correct. The first point I disagree with. The, on the first point, there was a bipartisan consensus that going back to the 1990s yes. that, that Saddam Hussein posed a threat to security in the Middle Listen, East. I'm part of it. Right. I agree I, with I'm it. part of it also. But, but that's different from saying that you were, you were waiting for the opportunity no, to attack. I wasn't wanting it to happen. Yeah. I wasn't hoping there'd be one. But when it happened, I believe there was a reflexive uh, realization. I would not have called it glee or, or cheering, but I think there was a reflexive realization that this will now lead to uh, hostilities with Iraq. And, and, and we know now that they were thinking about that at a moment when they had no reason to believe that Iraq had anything to do with the 9-11 attack. That's worth noting. It doesn't mean it was wrong to depose right. Saddam. I'm glad Saddam is gone. I think you can make great cases for deposing Saddam even without WMD. Yeah, but, but, but the point about Ron Paul is that he's imputing a motive. And he's imputing, when he says glee, he's saying people were happy. People were happy uh, about 9-11. Americans, American leaders, the Bush White House was happy about 9-11. That is no different from the far left wing conspiracy theories spouted by MoveOn.org and, and... And and this to me is the central problem with Ron Paul's candidacy. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, Carlos, but I feel like a lot of people have heard and like uh, what he is saying about the Constitution and the size of government. Unfortunately, if you want that from him, then you have to take all of this other stuff, which you're doing a good job of, of defending, but I can't believe even you were glad that that's the way he put it or that that was the ideal way to state it, because it isn't. Well, no, because you used the better word, uh, I forgot what you used, but anyway, yeah, reflexive. you used, yeah, reflect, whatever he's whatever he said. So, yeah, maybe the word glee wasn't the best way, but to... But that's how he talks, and, he, and he's yeah. made a history so, of saying things that are really off the cuff like that. So, 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 to use that one word, glee, and to say that his whole theory of what the Bush administration was feeling, I think it's also stretching. You pointed it out much clearer than what he did when you can explain it by saying, especially because in a debate you only have 30 seconds to, to give an answer, you know, so... Maybe that was the word that popped into his head. But, but even on the campaign trail, when he's got the whole thing to himself, uh, he can't resist going into Nuttyville. He it, just and can't. It's, and, and it's not right. It's not a one-off. He has a pattern over months and years. Of and there's no need things. for it because, as you pointed out, Jonathan, or one of you said, the Times are crying out for that economic message. If you just stop the speech there and not read the rest of it, 
about your feelings about Iran and Palestine's and imagine if you just if you would just stick to the economic part and only read page one, you'd be you'd be fine. I think the times are crying out for an anti-war president. Yesterday, um, statistics came out that 484 people died in com uh, 480 80 people died in combat but 484 people died of suicide. There's more suicide deaths than in combat. Is this what we're, is this what you're advocating to keep on going? I mean, this is gonna keep on going with Iran and all that, I mean, and that costs money. Are we supposed to be fiscal conservatives? How are you uh, gonna pay for it? Let me end on that rhetorical question and we will answer that and talk more about it on Gang of Four. It's 1058 on 550 KTSA. Okay, we're ready for our lightning round on Gang of Four. This is it for Gang of Four for 2011. This is our last show of 2011. Um, next week, I'm actually kind of excited by this. Normally I come back from time off and I feel like I have to, you know, apologize or read the complaint emails or whatever. We have a guy on next week named Steve Malsberg, who is a radio talk show host uh, from New York but who's really good, and I think people are really going to like him. In fact, I'm, I'm hoping they don't like him too much. Uh, but he'll be on next week, uh, Tuesday through uh, Friday. So this is our last live show uh, of the year before uh, next week and uh, our last gang of four. And by the way, you guys have been great today. Thank you for coming in and doing this. And Nico, I'm afraid in a few minutes you actually are going to have to go out and join Shop. your wife Christmas <laughs> shopping. Yeah. It's okay. Speaking of which, we had this story earlier this morning. Um, Best Buy is now informing some of its online customers, including people that ordered before Thanksgiving, Oops. that they're just not going to fill the orders. They're not saying, by the way, um, it'll be a little late or it's backed up. They're just dropping it. They're just saying, nope, never mind. How can you do that? Yeah, that that's a horrible, horrible public relations oh, move. I mean, does anybody remember reason? Circuit City? You know, yeah. I mean... Why'd they say? They, uh, they, they cannot meet the orders. Yeah. They, they promise stuff that they can't deliver on. Can't they deliver next year? Early next year? Nothing? We'll give you a Did, discount for a free purchase. Is, it, is, it, is, not something? Yeah. is yeah. a Christmas present still a Christmas present <laughs> on January 4th? Give a, give a letter, do something, picture. Yeah.